I'm going to talk a little bit about lung cancer um, and then maybe some more cheap and cheerful approaches uh, rather than the more expensive therapies you've been hearing about to date, which mainly involves the prevention of lung cancer, what we might do about that. Um, so this unfortunately is how a typical case of lung cancer might present uh, to me. Um, this I increasingly think of as a young woman uh, who has been complaining of a cough and a small bit of blood in her sputum for the past four weeks and she's lost a little bit of weight. Um, and she's managed to stop smoking about a year ago. Um, and I'll draw your attention to the x-ray, which um, has the unfortunate uh, moniker of a shadow on the x-ray there, as you can see on the left side. I think you can probably uh, all see that. So this is how, a, how typically a lung cancer might present to us. Lung cancer, unfortunately, is the leading cause of cancer death worldwide. So skin cancer is more common, but thankfully most people with skin cancer survive. But more people die of lung cancer than any other cancer worldwide. About one in five of all cancer deaths in this country is caused by lung cancer. And the cause of cancer is, um, in nine out of ten cases still in this country, is smoking. Uh, now we understand a bit more about who is the susceptible smoker, but still smoking is the most important cause. In, uh, this is uh, data from the National Cancer Registry in Ireland, and over the last 20 years, you can see that the incidence in purple, the purple line is men, and the uh, orange line there is women. And you can see that over the last 20 years, and reflecting somewhat the patterns of smoking behavior 20, 30 years before that, you'll see that the rate or the incidence of um, of lung cancer in men has been falling somewhat and the incidence in women has been rising, unfortunately. And if you're unfortunate enough to get lung cancer, this is where you lie in the all cancer table. This is not a league table you'd like to necessarily be at the bottom of. And for us who are, in, who are interested and involved in the care of lung cancer, um, I think that there must be some, something to be done about this because if you're unfortunate enough to get some of these cancers, your chances of being, survive, of being alive in five years' time is thankfully has improved significantly over the last number of decades. And so while some of these cancers can be obviously can be very, very severe and serious, we've made lots of progress with them. If we look down towards the bottom part of the table, this is the relative survival, National Cancer Registry in Ireland as of 2013. You can see, unfortunately, only about 10 or 15% of people, five years after a diagnosis of lung cancer, will be alive. So it's a common cancer, and it's a common cancer killer, unfortunately. And as a reflection of that, this is the years of life lost to cancer in Ireland, and looking at the uh, many uh, different organ cancers, okay, from men, for men here and for women. And you can see it's pretty much, it's well out in front in, for men. And in, 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 in actually just very, re in the last two or three years, it's overtaken breast cancer as the commonest uh, cancer killer in women are the cause of, of years of life left, of, of life lost. So ser a, a serious uh, big problem for us. So for just to summarize that sort of national perspective, it's lung cancer kills more Irish people every year than breast and bowel cancer combined. Um, in 2012, it overtook breast cancer as the commonest cancer killer in women. There are about 2,500, so this isn't really a rare disease. There's 2,500 new, new cases of lung cancer every year in Ireland. I mentioned smoking, and I'm going to spend the latter half of the talk speaking a bit more about smoking and smoking-related disease in particular. But many people who present now with lung, with lung cancer managed to stop smoking. So it presents as commonly now in ex-smokers, and that's important in terms of vigilance by people and, and their doctors as to who is at risk. And unfortunately, two out of every three people in this country who present with lung cancer do at a present to us at a point where it's no longer curable, it's incurable, or it's advanced at stage. So what are the symptoms of, of, um, of lung cancer? Uh, are things that might, uh, you know, you might want to see your doctor about. And in particular, we would say, get a chest x-ray in the event of these symptoms. Well, an unexplained or a persistent cough. And I think of that being more than three weeks where it's unexplained. Now, some people with lung cancer have coexisting conditions. We heard a lot about, um, or we heard something about emphysema and asthma, bronchiectasis earlier on. So these conditions can cause cough. 
But an alteration in the character or the, or the severity of a chronic cough should alert somebody to, to maybe trigger a chest X-ray. Coughing of blood, that's not a normal thing to have. Unexplained other symptoms. And you'll see here chest pain, breathlessness, weight loss, and bone pain. So I'm sorry, I admitted the pain there from bone. But really, there's a myriad of symptoms that lung cancer can present with. And what will all strike you is that these could be common to other conditions as well. So we don't have really any good specific symptom with, with lung cancer. And, it's, and that is perhaps one of the reasons why it presents late. Because within the lungs themselves, disease can become quite advanced before you become aware of it. So I've mentioned the risk factors for lung cancer. Smoking, 9 out of 10 cases still in this country. There are others though, radon gas exposure. Asbestos, um, asbestos which uh, was used in insulation, shipbuilding, lagging in brakes for people who, um, who worked in, in garages in, and in, uh, and in brake, brake pad maintenance. These are the places that asbestos, which was a tremendous insulator, was used in. A condition called pulmonary fibrosis has much more com is much more commonly associated with lung cancer. And these other exposures, in addition to is smoking, become synergistic. So in other words, they add together and the risk increases even more. Now, this is an x-ray that uh, you've seen a few x-rays already, and this is a, a, an x-ray um, of a patient who has lung cancer, but it's not very obvious they have a lung cancer on that x-ray. And unfortunately, this is a, an x-ray of somebody who has much more advanced disease, and we can all see that the x-ray looks abnormal. On the right side, it's all white, some dense opacification or collapse of that whole lung on the right-hand side. And these are the conditions, this, this is the bronchoscopy appearance of this person, which looks pretty healthy and normal still. And this is the time we want to be getting lung cancer, at least want to be detecting it. Unfortunately, this other person, in both cases, patients of mine, had a tumour visible, a fairly nasty looking tumour visible, in that same space, blocking off the airway when we looked down at the bronchoscopy. So trying to find cancer at an earlier stage would intuitively maybe budge that lung cancer and the poor, mortal and the poor um, performance we have with regard to mortality up, this, up the, uh, increase the survival. And so this is a, a person with a small tumour, which is here on the CT scan. And we do PET scanning now, which is a very useful functional scan. A CAT scan is a very good anatomical scan. It shows us the insides very well. It's a cross-sectional scan. It shows this little nodule here. And a PET scan, using a, 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 a radio-labeled glucose, essentially, uh, allows us to see that this is a hot spot, you see? So it's very, very simply shows us that that little nodule is quite active, taking up glucose, and needs to be removed. Now, in the last number of years, we've had quite a significant advances with regard to management of lung cancer and management of those types of small nodules. Because previously we'd say, well, they have to be operated on, they have to be removed, and that's uh, still probably the standard of care. But there are better, or there are increasingly um, better delivery systems for, for other types of treatment. One such is this, which is a radiotherapy machine, and this stereotactic body radiotherapy, which has, in, in certain individuals with early lung cancers, been as effective as having the operation. I'm, I don't think as yet that our, our thoracic surgeons um, will be out of a job, but this is an option and a, quite a good option for some patients with early stage lung cancer. In particular, those who might be considered maybe not too well or too, un, too, too unfit for other reasons to have an operation. But unfortunately, the, uh, and for many cases, the lung cancer is at a more advanced stage. And you'll have heard from my colleagues and from Professor McAvaney uh, earlier on that we don't, think of things, we, we don't think of things as one disease so much anymore. And increasingly you want to find out, um, as Dr. Ryan had said, what, the, what, is the, what particular type of asthma do I have, or what particular type of bronchiectasis, or indeed what particular type of lung cancer. And so this is the evolution of how we think about lung cancer over the last sort of 10 or 15 years, from one disease to different types, squamous and adenocarcinoma types, to now increasingly identifying within those categories that there are many, many more pieces of the pie, a bit like this, this, the CF story as we heard. And why that's important, and why it's important to recognize that, is because when we can identify these, then we can try and target these areas. So develop medication that can target these particular abnormalities in the individual person's cancer. 
rather than taking a, 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 an approach off the shelf for everybody, saying develop more personalized treatment. Okay, and we've heard that team a little bit already in the, in the last few talks. And indeed, many of these uh, mutations that give rise to these cancers are now uh, have um, available medication that has made significant changes in the outcomes for patients with lung cancer. Less so in this squamous cell cancer type, but this is the type of cancer that's becoming much more uh, uh, prevalent. I'm going to spend the last few minutes talking about prevention, though, because I think we need to, um, and it's not, that it's not the, the most expensive thing. We talked about expensive therapies, radiotherapies, but smoking, unfortunately, is still the problem here for many patients for why they develop lung cancer in the first place. And we know that what, what, the, what the problem is, is not necessarily the nicotine, which is what the cause of the addiction is, but it's all the other things that are contained in cigarette smoke. We also know that smoking addiction starts early in life, fortunately for this young man. And the reasons for that, you know, I think probably we're all, we don't see ads like this anymore, but clearly they're targeting a particular group, aren't they? So the industry realizes that this is the person to get. Okay, not the sensible person who might have, you know, very few people start smoking after the age of 20, as it turns out. There are exceptions. <laughs> I'll, I'll give you that. Um, and there always are excep exceptions. And that's why, as we said, knowing a little bit more about the biology and the physiology, uh, understanding more about the individual person and why some are resent, uh, more, uh, more susceptible to conditions becomes very important for us when we're interested in these diseases. What I will say about tobacco smoking, though, is that it kills up to half of its users. That very successful, I think, campaign many of you will have seen on the TV, one in two. Okay, so one in two people, unfortunately, would die prematurely if they continued to smoke. It's the single largest preventable cause of death and disease. Okay, so it's, uh, um, there's no risk-free level, unfortunately, of tobacco smoke exposure. But I only smoke a couple of cigarettes a day. It's, unfortunately, there's no risk-free level. It's not like other things. And, and there is no safe tobacco product. This uh, is a study, um, a, a global burden of disease study. It was published last week in The Lancet. Um, it was, it's, from, it's a worldwide study. It's sponsored, this study was actually um, sponsored by um, Bill and Melinda Gates and, and their foundation, okay? So we have to believe it, right? But they've got great graphics as a consequence. But this shows you where, what is the rank of smoking as a risk factor for disability? I'm not talking about lung cancer particularly here, I'm talking about all disability. Disability, and we, we reflect that in something called dis, uh, DALYs or disability adjusted life years. So chronic diseases, uh, lung diseases clearly, which we're talking about tonight, cardiovascular diseases, stroke and, and so forth. And number one in the Western Euro Europe, North America, Australia. Not so high in other parts of the world yet, because these are parts of the world that smoking really has, has only really taken off in the last 20 years, and these are parts of the world where smoking is on the decline. So smoking is still the number one, it's not, you know, a, a cause of preventable uh, disability and disease. It's important to remember that, um, because we do hear a lot about other, other health things that are, affect our health. There are still a billion smokers in the world. It's still a massive industry, okay? Um, because I think, you know, over the last decade in Ireland, it's become less of a, that's evident to us, I think. This one in four men smoke, in, worldwide this is, and one in 20 women, five million people will die this year of, of tobacco, from tobacco-related uh, disease, okay? And that's on the rise, it's not on the fall. But importantly, three out of four smokers actually want to quit, okay? Um, and very few of them do it successfully. So this is an area we really need to support. This is a, 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 just a slide to illustrate to you. This was the US Surgeon General's report from uh, three years ago. The first one of these reports, which demonstrated conclusively and summarized the, the data on smoking-related disease, was 50 years before that, okay, so 19, um, in, in 64. And um, all of these were, were known about at that time. The reds are the new ones in the 50 years. So for many years, we've known all about this. Lung disease we're talking about today, liver, pancreas, colorectal cancers, diabetes, all the rest of it there, okay? Um, so these are the direct health consequences of smoking. Now, we have done a lot in Ireland. This is our, one of our previous ministers for health, and he's responsible for some of those gruesome pictures you see on, on cigarette packets. Uh, smoking cars. This is the, some students in, in the um, 
uh, Westport College, uh, uh, um, uh, who had banned smoking on campus a number of years ago, and other campuses are. So, you know, we're seeing less, I think, uh, smoking. We're not smoking in this auditorium, which is where we might have been even you know, 20, 30 years ago. So there is a benefit to quitting smoking at every age, okay? This is a large um, a, a review, but just showing you that never smoking versus life expectancy, smoking and never smoking, is about 10 years on average, okay? So 10 years, that's the difference in quality life expectancy. But even quitting cigarette smoking at the age of 65, and indeed it goes beyond that, the evidence shows that your life expectancy will be, more, will be prolonged. For women, about two and a half years, 2.7 years, for men, a year and a half. So when people who say to me, well, I've been smoking and, you know, I've been smoking now 40 years, you know, is there still a benefit? Indeed there is. This is one thing that people have been turning to. I don't know much, uh, too much. Uh, there's not a lot of data here on this. It's, it's promising, potentially. Is it a tobacco product? It probably isn't. It's got nicotine in it. How is it regulated? We, it's, it's difficult to know. But increasingly, we're using them. And, and, and within the EU, about 7 or 8% of, of, of uh, people are habitual users of, of uh, electronic cigarettes. Is that a good thing? Uh, probably reduces harm. This is an advertisement for True, which is a, um, a cigarette. Considering all I'd heard about the other guys, I switched to this cigarette. Of course, these filtered cigarettes really made no difference. And in fact, some would say, and there's some evidence to suggest that filtered cigarettes, which were in the lighter branded region, uh, are more responsible for adenocarcinomas, which is the cancers I mentioned that are increasingly becoming evident in women. So this is our very similar ad now, this year, for um, electronic cigarette. So maybe electronic cigarettes could be very helpful in reducing harm from cigarettes, but, it's, it, but the, the industry is, is, is a bit muddled here. Um, and potentially, some would say, the electronic cigarette could normalize the habit of smoking, which we've done a lot to reduce in this country in particular. So could these be a wolf in sheep's clothing? I don't know. But I'd like to summarize by saying that and to remind you that lung cancer is the number one cancer killer in, this, in, in the world. Um, and it kills more people than many other ca common cancers that we hear more about combined. Smoking is by far the largest cause, but it's, anyone can get lung cancer, so it's not just for smokers. Um, and we, as I mentioned, stopping smoking and not, have, uh, uh, not, being, uh, not being a smoker will reduce significantly your, your, your chances of getting lung cancer. So it's theoretically preventable in eight out of 10 cases, but that would still leave 250 or 300 cases a year in this country of lung cancer. And we're getting to know a little bit more about those types of cancer and the treatments are improving on those types of cancers and in the smoking related cancers. And hopefully that number I showed you earlier on or the, the National Cancer Registry data that I showed you before, um, will that, that pessimistic 15% five year survival is hopefully on the increase uh, and the improvement curve over the last decade. Um, and people who are, who are smoked generally are addicted to nicotine and would benefit from stopping smoking medic and medications and counseling that do that, we probably need to do better at. Uh, and so I will um, leave it there, Professor McAvaney, I think. Thank you.